Hello, hello. Welcome to Duck Potatoes World. Today we are reading chapter four of Listen to Crickets, a story about Rachel Carson by Candace F. Ransom. Chapter four, Life on the Shore. The house rose from the rocks, almost part of the cliff that towered above Sheepscot Bay. Ever since Rachel has visited Maine years earlier, she'd longed for a house at the very edge of the sea. She and her mother had rented cottages in Maine during past summers, but now Rachel had a seaside cottage of her own. With her earnings from the sea around us, Rachel had bought a one and a half acre tract of land in West Southport near Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. The cottage she had built was simple, but the windows were large seats of glass that let in vast views of the sea and sky. With her bedroom only steps from the beach, Rachel had a laboratory literally at her feet. The Carson family was much smaller by 1953. Rachel's nieces were grown and Marjorie had a one-year-old son, Roger. Rachel, her mother, and her cat muffin migrated north every spring, staying until October when it was time to shut off the wa water pipes and return to Maryland. The cottage was a wonderful place to relax. Mrs. Carson was crippled with arthritis, but her days were brightened by the loons and baby seals she glimpsed from the window. Once, Rachel pointed out a whale splashing at the mouth of the harbor. Revived by the salt air, Rachel was ready to get back to work. She had a new book contract. The Houghton Mifflin publishing firm had asked her to write a guidebook about shore life. Rachel was eager to start on the new book. Like most writers, she was always more interested in the work ahead of her than in what she had already accomplished. With her biologist's belt loaded with specimen bottles and a magnifying glass, Rachel explored the tide pools near her cottage during low tide. Rachel belonged here more than any place else in the world, shin deep in chilly water with the fog softly brushing her cheek and the soothing sush sushing of the water lapping against the rocks. Research for the guidebook was endlessly fascinating and enjoyable, made even more so by the fact that Rachel had help. Bob Hines, an artist and longtime friend from the Fish and Wildlife Service, had been commissioned by Houghton Mifflin to draw the illustrations for Rachel's book. They worked together as a team, catching scurrying crabs for Bob to sketch, or marveling at a colony of anemones clinging to the underside of a rock. Rachel's editor, Paul Brooks, also visited the cottage. After supper, he and Rachel would peer through her microscope at creatures captured in Rachel's specimen bottles. They observed thread-like worms, tiny snails, and miniature sponges, inhabitants of an underwater fairyland. Then, no matter how late the hour, Rachel would carry the creatures in a bucket down the steps to the beach and return them to their home, the tide pools. The Edge of the Sea was her book, and it was published in 1955. It was much more than a guidebook. It described the life and geology of the East Coast from the rocky shoreline north of Cape Cod to the sandy beaches of the Mid-Atlantic to the coral reefs and mangrove coastline farther south. The Edge of the Sea was nearly as successful as the sea around us. Rachel was proud of her new book. It represented many happy hours sharing the world of the sea with friends and loved ones. This book also complete complemented her two earlier books, Under the Sea Wind, Described Life in and Near the Sea, and The Sea Around Us Tackled the Sea Itself. Rachel wrote The Edge of the Sea with the word ecology uppermost in her mind. Ecology is the study of the way living things relate to their environment and to each other. Rachel did not simply want to catalog seashells as one might find in a guidebook. She wanted people to know about the animals who lived in the shells. Next, Rachel turned her attention from the sea to the clouds. She wrote a television script called Something About the Sky. The program was broadcast in March of 1956. Then Rachel shifted her focus in yet another direction, viewing nature through a child's eyes. Roger, her grandnephew, had been present in Rachel's life since he was a baby. Rachel's niece Marjorie brought Roger to the cottage in Maine summer after summer. Roger's father, had died before Roger ever knew him, but in Rachel's house there were plenty of people to love a little boy. Even before he could walk, Roger began to accompany Rachel on her ramblings. She wanted him to experience nature in all weathers, day and night. When Roger was a baby, Rachel had carried him down to the beach to meet the sea. The baby in her arms laughed with delight at the tumbling waters. As he grew older, Roger would sit on Rachel's lap, quietly watching the moon on the water. Once, out walking in the woods near the house, Rachel pointed to a spruce tree seedling. She told Roger the tiny tree was a Christmas tree for squirrels, since it was just the right size. She described how the squirrels decorated their tree with shells and tiny pine cones. They came to a smaller seedling. Keeping up the game, Rachel said the tinier tree was probably a Christmas tree for bugs. 
A larger tree became a Christmas tree for rabbits and woodchucks. Enchanted with the idea of animals celebrating holidays, Roger would warn Rachel not to step on the Christmas trees. Rachel wrote about their walks in an article that was published in Women's Home Companion magazine. She realized the importance of sharing nature with a child, and she hoped parents would take their children on nature walks, too. The article was well-received, and several publishers urged Rachel to turn the article into a book. Rachel always intended to do this, but never had the time. The Sense of Wonder, a book based on the article, was published a year after her death. Like the ebb and flow of the sea, the Carson household grew and shrank and grew again. Marjorie and Roger spent their summers at the Maine cottage, and there was always a cat. Now Jeffy the cat traveled from Maryland to Maine as a valued member of the family. One moonlit night, Rachel and Marjorie went down to the beach to secure four-year-old Roger's raft, which was being pulled out to sea by the restless spring tides. The sand glittered with green and yellow specks like emeralds and diamonds. Rachel and Marjorie scooped up handfuls of the sparkles. Then one of the sparkles flew away. It was a firefly attracted by the shimmering sand. The firefly thought the sparkles were other fireflies. Rachel captured the hapless insect and put it in Roger's bucket to dry. Marjorie and Rachel giggled like schoolgirls over the incident. In early 1957, Marjorie died of pneumonia. Rachel missed her very much. She had raised Marjorie like a daughter and had been close to her all her life. Like the firefly Rachel and Marjorie had watched that summer, a life had sparkled and then was gone. Five-year-old Roger was left without any parents. Mrs. Carson was 88 and in need of constant care. Nearing 50, Rachel was not in good health herself. She was plagued with the arthritis that crippled so many members of her family, and she caught a lot of colds. But Rachel loved Roger as though he were her own son, so she adopted him. So far, Rachel's work had led her to the sea and even to the sky. Now she began to look around her and observe what was happening to the land. She did not like what she saw. Forests had been cut down. Factories dumped their poisonous waste products into rivers. Entire wildlands were cleared to make way for houses and roads. People were destroying the world. Rachel had not been unaware of what was going on around her, even while she was so immersed in her studies of the sea. Shortly after World War II, in the mid-40s, Rachel and Shirley Briggs, a colleague at the Fish and Wildlife Service, had been assigned to put together a series of booklets called Conservation in Action. Inspired by material gathering expeditions, Rachel often scribbled notes about the small creatures, such as spiders and crickets, that still fascinated her. Just as they had when she was a child, she found herself listening to the crickets late one summer night. Had she ever really listened before? Concentrating, she realized the cricket chorus was made up of individual voices. One cricket in particular had such a sweet, haunting voice, she named it the Fairy Bell Ringer. Rachel searched night after night for this cricket, but could never find it. The cricket remained hidden, sweetly chirping the message that summer was ending. And now, more than 10 years after listening to that cricket chorus, Rachel was afraid something else might be ending too. The natural world was in grave danger unless someone did something about it. Rachel was tired, but she had one more task before her. Like the fairy bell ringer, she would make herself heard, but she would not remain invisible. Well, I hope you'll join us next time for chapter five when we find out what Rachel is going to do about her concerns for the environment.